Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my midweek mystery series where today I want to share the story of the disappearance of 14 year old Margaret Ellen Fox. She vanished in 1974 and will be 61 years old if she's still alive today. There's never been any answers as to what happened to her but no one has given up on the search. In fact, as recently as 2017, the FBI have released a brand new audio pertaining to the case, and at the same time, they announced they're offering a reward of up to $25,000 for information leading to the arrest and or the conviction of the person or persons responsible for Margaret's disappearance. She's currently classed as endangered missing, and honestly, there's not a load of information out there about her case, but I'm going to share what I can. According to The Charlie Project, Margaret Ellen Fox played piano and loved to ride horses. She had just graduated from St Paul's Grammar School in Burlington just two weeks before she vanished and was set to join St Paul's Roman Catholic School. A Burlington police sergeant, John Stefanoni, would say in 2001, I grew up with the girl, knew the family. The family was, and still is, a genuine American family. The father was a town plumber, they were devoted Catholics. I can just imagine the tragedy this has put the family through. Margaret was last seen on the 24th of June 1974 in Burlington, New Jersey. She was 14 years old and was on her way to meet a man who called himself John Marshall after he had responded to a classified ad she'd put in the local newspaper offering her services as a babysitter alongside her cousin Lynn Parks. Some sources state that Lynn was a cousin, others state that she was just a friend but honestly I don't really think that matters for the bigger picture here. The ad read, Babysitters, experienced, teen girls, love kids, work at your house, call Lynn's home phone number followed by Margaret's home phone number. Nowadays you can look at the advert and just see how it's basically calling out for a predator to contact them, those clean cut all American teenage girls looking for a babysitting job to earn a bit of extra money. If you're a man looking for a young victim, the ad section in the paper seems to be an easy place to look, but of course they didn't think of that back then. This man, called John Marshall, first contacted Lynn as her number was listed first, but it turns out that Lynn's parents wouldn't let her go to this job, so instead he called Margaret on the 19th of June. He told her that he needed a babysitter, that him and his wife lived in nearby Mount Holly and they had a backyard swimming pool and a swing set. Marshall told Margaret that he needed a babysitter from 9.30am to 1.30am each day, that he would pay her $40 a week plus bus fare and that either him or his wife would drop her back home between 2 and 2.30pm each day. Margaret's father David also spoke to this man on the phone just to make sure everything was okay. David took this man's name and his number but never took down his address and he would later say that he believed the man was between 35 and 40 years old, just based on his voice. Marshall and Margaret planned to meet for an interview, but he postponed this several times over the coming days. This is interesting to me. It suggests that this man either had second thoughts about what he was planning to do, or he really was a family man and really did have to keep postponing his plans. Eventually, he told Margaret that he would meet her on the corner of Mill and High Streets in Mount Holly in a red Volkswagen Beetle, and he gave her a telephone number to reach him at. This phone number was later traced to a public phone booth at an A&P supermarket in Lumberton, New Jersey. The name John Marshall is one you'll see a lot in Mount Holly. It's the name of a former Chief Justice in the town in the late 1700s to early 1800s. His name is found on several buildings and is even the name of a school. If you're searching for an alias to use, subconsciously, that's probably going to be a name on your mind a lot in this area. According to the Trace Evidence podcast as well, John Marshall was also the name of a manager at the supermarket the phone call was traced back to. Of course, this John Marshall was questioned, but he had an alibi that checked out and he passed a polygraph test. It very well could be that the kidnapper walked into the store to make the call and saw the name John Marshall and decided that that was the name he was going to use. Others think that this guy, the manager at the store, should have been looked into further. But if you ask me, it takes a very stupid criminal to use your own name when fishing for a victim and also provide the number for the supermarket you worked at. 
At approximately 8.40am on June 24th, Margaret started her journey to Mount Holly from her home in Burlington, New Jersey to finally meet this John Marshall. She left a note at home for her parents to let them know where she was going along with Marshall's phone number and then headed to the bus stop with her little brother, 11 year old Joseph. Joseph didn't get on the bus with her but he just joined her for the walk. That was the last time somebody who knew her saw Margaret but witnesses did later tell investigators they'd seen her on the bus and after she got off the bus in Mount Holly near Mill Street and High Street. But after that, she was never seen or heard from again. No witnesses ever reported seeing Margaret be snatched off the street, but it likely wouldn't have been like that. She likely would have happily got into this man's car. At the time of her disappearance, Margaret was wearing jeans with a yellow patch on the knee, a blue blouse, a white and black checkered jacket, and brown sandals with a heel strap. She was also wearing a gold necklace with flowers and a blue stone, and a gold charm bracelet with a blue stone. She was carrying a glasses case with a Huckleberry Hound design on it, but was wearing the glasses at the time. She also had two teeth missing, the top front right teeth. Margaret was white with blue eyes and brown hair, 5 foot 2 and about 105 pounds at the time of her disappearance. Some sources state that she also had a swimming costume with her so she could go swimming in the pool at John Marshall's house, but nothing on the official FBI page states that. When Margaret didn't arrive home at 2.30pm that afternoon, as she said she would be, her family got concerned. They found the note that Margaret had left for them with details of the babysitting job, including the number for John Marshall. Her mum, Mary, called that phone number that they believed was for the Marshall residence, but whoever answered told her that her daughter wasn't there. It was only when she called back a second time that Mary was told that the number she was calling was for a supermarket. That's when the panic really set in. Mary and David soon notified the authorities of their daughter's disappearance. Straight away, authorities suspected that Margaret had been abducted. It was very obvious that all the signs pointed in that direction. Mary and David were interviewed, but they were sure that Margaret hadn't run away. Mary said she had no boyfriends, she hadn't started to date yet. She was never in trouble for anything. Mere hours after she'd been reported missing, the police started recording all phone calls placed to the family home. Soon, a phone call came in from a man who demanded a $10,000 ransom for Margaret's safe return. He claimed that he had her in his custody and said, $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. Her mother is heard asking, who is this? $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topic. Who is it? As you can hear, it's this audio that the FBI released in 2017, with the Burlington City Police Chief stating it had never previously been possible to release the audio of this call because it hadn't been clear enough. The FBI spent years working with all the latest technologies trying to enhance the tape so it could finally be released to the public. I'm unsure how far the word of Margaret's disappearance would have spread in the immediate few hours after her disappearance, and the Burlington City Police Chief did say on the release of the audio that the authorities are uncertain if the call really was from this elusive John Marshall, or simply someone who was aware of her disappearance and sees the moment as an opportunity for financial gain. But the fact that they released this audio after so many years suggests that they definitely think it's an avenue worth following. I'm no expert with accents, particularly American accents, but to my ear, my immediate thought when I heard this was that this sounded like an Italian-American accent or a New York kind of accent. It is quite distinctive. Discussion online seemed to think the same thing. I saw quite a few people suggesting this accent is specifically from Long Island, New York. Others say it's typical New Jersey. But of course, there's every chance that whoever this was, whether it was the kidnapper or just a random person, they would put on an accent to hide their true identity. I guess an accent like this one would be one of the more obvious ones to put on, particularly if you are from the area. I did also see speculation of this being the accent of a Latino man from the Bronx, French Canadian and others, so it is hard to pinpoint. Also, the wording of the statement is very weird. Who says buttered topping? It's very odd. You would just say butter, wouldn't you? 
There has been a lot of backlash over police taking 45 years to release this audio, with many people thinking they should have released it no matter the quality at the time of the disappearance. And I do admit I see both sides of the coin here. There probably wouldn't have been much point releasing an unclear audio for people to focus on instead of actually searching and keeping an eye out for Margaret, but also if somebody did recognise the voice at the time, any chance of them remembering specific people and voices 45 years down the line is probably long gone. But also, in 1974, most people would have got their news via newspapers, and obviously you can't release audio via the paper. If they released it to TV news stations back then, it likely wouldn't have been heard by anywhere near as many people as releasing it in today's day and age allows. With social media, things like this can spread really fast and effectively. But let's get back to 1974. The day after the phone call, a letter arrived at the Fox's house. It repeated what the phone call had said and instructed the parents to put the money in a box with blue wrapping paper the same colour as Margaret's blouse. The letter writer claimed that Margaret was okay, that they'd only torn her blouse and broke her glasses. It could be that the writer included the detail about the colour of Margaret's blouse to try and convince the family and the authorities that they really were the one who had Margaret. Maybe they really did, but the clothing she was wearing had already been reported in the media, so anyone could have known this. However, it's not clear whether or not her glasses had been publicly mentioned. Latent fingerprints were found and lifted off the letter, but they didn't match any of the military members, federal employees, and thousands of offenders whose prints were on file with the Burlington County Jail, Prosecutor's Office, and Mount Holly Police. These fingerprints have been subsequently lost at some point over the years, and as of 2017, they couldn't be located, which is pretty annoying, as who knows what new forensic technology could lead to nowadays. They also lost Margaret's dental records at some point. Alongside the fingerprints, there was another clue on this letter as well. It ended with the phrase, so long again. The first letters, the S, the L and the A, were highlighted. These were the initials of the Symbionese Liberation Army, a terrorist organisation that was pretty well known at the time, as they had kidnapped a 19-year-old girl called Patty Hearst earlier that same year. Patty was indoctrinated by the group and was found 19 months later. Her story is fascinating and I might actually make a video on her at some point soon. But it seems the writer of the letter was trying to suggest that the SLA were also responsible for Margaret's abduction. Margaret's parents did withdraw the money it seemed, ready to exchange it for their daughter because of course which parent wouldn't? But then things went silent. They never received any instructions on how to deliver it. Two days later, another letter arrived saying, $10,000 was a lot of bread, but your daughter's life was the buttered topping. Past tense. According to the FBI, the letter indicated that the ransom exchange was off because the parents had goofed in making the arrangements. Still, to this day, nobody knows if the letters and the phone call were legit or a hoax, and after the second letter, there was no further communication received. Investigators did what they could to track Margaret down. The day after she disappeared, Detective Leonard Burr boarded the bus that she had taken that day. He spoke with a woman who said that she'd sat behind Margaret on the journey, that she remembered her clearly as her son had pulled Margaret's hair, causing her to turn around and chat with them. Margaret was happy and smiley. Another passenger said that she watched as a girl matching Margaret's appearance got off the bus at High and West Broad Street's intersection for stopping and talking to a young man in a red sports car. That's thought to be the last sighting of her. Now it does seem that investigators actually managed to track down this man in the red sports car and speak to him, and it was found that he was not involved. Margaret had mistakenly approached him because of the colour of his vehicle. Margaret's photo was shown to approximately 200 people in downtown Mount Holly for any information, and David Fox, her father, would walk the streets with his sons, hoping that he would be the one to talk to the right person eventually. But that person never came. A few weeks after the disappearance, a $650 reward was donated by residents and local businesses for any information that led to Margaret's discovery, but obviously that didn't lead to any answers. 
Interestingly, in the weeks after, police received many calls from local residents saying that strangers had attempted to lure their daughters to fake babysitting jobs. Clearly, whoever had done this had been trying to do it for a while. The investigation was pretty rough in the early days, it seems, because none of the agencies involved in this actually communicated with each other. They didn't share information. The FBI was a completely separate entity from the Burlington police. If the FBI found something out, they didn't have to share it with the police. The search for Margaret was conducted under two completely separate investigations that probably would have been much more effective as one. But then, over a year later, in November 1975, there was a massive break in the case when a convict confessed to her kidnapping and murder. Charles Clowbridge was serving time for larceny at the Montgomery County Jail in Norristown, Pennsylvania, and he told the authorities that he wanted to confess. He claimed that he took Margaret from Mount Holly and killed her in the Catskills Mountain, strangling her and throwing her off a cliff. He told them exactly where they could find the body, so investigators literally went up the mountains in a helicopter and they searched. They found nothing. Then Clowbridge changed his story. Now he said that she'd been buried in landfills in Burlington County. It looked like the police were being taken for a ride at this point, and soon it was found that Clowbridge had actually been in hospital in North Jersey on the night of Margaret's disappearance. They had all the details of his hospital stay, down to the minute of when his temperature was taken and when he was given medication. It's thought that he wanted to be sent to prison permanently as he was homeless and just wanted a roof over his head. It's actually quite sad and he soon confessed to the hoax at trial. Two years later, another potential suspect pinged investigators' radar when a sex offender in the area was found to have a red VW Beetle. He was interviewed but had a solid alibi in the form of a logbook he kept for his ham radio operations. They thought that was enough to clear him, it seems. In 1992, a girl's body was found in the Atlantic Highlands in Monmouth County, approximately an hour's drive away from Mount Holly. It was widely speculated at the time that this could have been Margaret. But because Margaret's dental records had been lost, it was very hard to confirm the body was not hers, but it seems that eventually it was confirmed it wasn't her. The police do have a composite sketch of a man that they would like to talk to in relation to this case, and they have also released age progress photos of Margaret over the years. If she's still alive today, she'll be 61 years old. The investigation into Margaret's disappearance is still ongoing, and it actually seems like it's retired detectives dedicating their time to this now for free, in an effort to stop it from going completely cold. As the Burlington County Prosecutor Scott Coffina said in 2019 in an FBI press release, Margaret Fox was loved dearly by her family and friends. To this day, her disappearance continues to cause great sorrow. If someone out there possesses information that could assist the investigators working to solve this mystery, I urge you to come forward. Her parents have since died, David in 1993 and Mary in 2003. Two of her brothers have also passed away and it's unclear if her surviving siblings are still living in Burlington or the immediate local area. The family and the investigators who have worked tirelessly on this case for many years just want closure, they just want an answer. They acknowledge the likelihood that Margaret is dead but say that she deserves a proper burial. The FBI is offering a reward of up to $25,000 for any information leading to an arrest or conviction in the case. And authorities ask anyone with information regarding Margaret's whereabouts, call the FBI's Newark office or Burlington City Police Department. The details of both I'll leave down below. Thank you so much for tuning in today. As always, I ask you if you live in any of the areas I've mentioned in today's video, then please just share this story around, talk to people about it. You never know, it could help. I guess I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.